kidding. So we do want to honor Pastor Ravi today. It is his birthday. They're in Israel. Um, it is about 7.30 p.m. there, so they're probably eating some kind of fish out of the Sea of Galilee or something right now. So Pastor Ravi, we love you. Happy birthday. We honor you, sir. Let's just, let's just honor Pastor Ravi really quick for his birthday. What better way to spend your birthday than in the Holy Land? I don't know. So anyhow. Hope you guys have a blast. We'll see y'all soon. Uh, We are going to continue this series today. We're in the 2020 series, and last week you got to hear, um, how many of you were here last week? Okay, good. How many of you watched online? Anybody? A few? All right. So everybody, most of the room kind of, at least you've participated in that that, uh, message in some form or fashion, so I'm not going to try to reteach it, Um, but really the pastors just came up and kind of told a story, the story uh, of how they got to the point where they became the lead pastors of Epic Church, and then from that point on, how the church grew and developed and kind of led us up to where we are right now, in a way. Um, And so in this 2020 series, we've talked about, last week, we kind of talked about who we are. We talked about, uh, they they really shared who they are. We really talked about who we are as a church, and so today we're going to continue that um, journey, and we're going to talk about why we're here currently and then uh, as we progress the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear about where we're going and, and things, the, the benefits of being in the tribe and things like that. And so the, the purpose of this whole series is to really kind of rally us all back together to one central vision, uh, gain some clarity on, on who we are, why we're here, where we're going, all those types of things. And so we're going to continue that today uh, with a, a, a fun little illustration. If you can't tell, there's a big table behind me. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to act like it's not there. I had to walk around it to get here. So um, I'm going to use this today to hopefully, um, in, a, in, a, in a positive way, hopefully challenge us all um, on, on kind of the way that we see and our perspective uh, around the idea of why we're here. And so I want to start with this. Um, anybody have that special dish that special plate that you, you, like if you go to a party, if you get invited somewhere and they say, hey, just bring whatever you want to bring, you already know what you're bringing. Anybody got that? Raise your hand if you got it. Okay. Whose who's go-to is like dessert? Like you're like, I'm taking my famous dessert. Okay. Anybody into like macaroni and cheese or mashed potatoes or like, I tell you what, on three, just shout it out. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. So now I know who to invite. All right. Um, so I don't really have a, a special, or I, I don't think I do. Like, I don't really necessarily have, like, a dish that I like. If I get invited somewhere, I'm like, oh, I'm bringing this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut it down with this thing. But in the first service, I was reminded. Garrett Marsh was sitting in the back, and he shouted out, white chicken chili. And I was like, oh, yeah, I do make really good white chicken chili. So that's my thing. Like, now... Now I remember, I'm just going to start taking that everywhere, right? (laughs) Pastor Amy, my wife, uh, in the last couple of years has discovered her specialty. And it is this thing called dessert mac and cheese. Anybody in the room had the dessert mac and cheese? A lot of these guys have, I know, okay. Um, So this was an accident. She used wrong ingredients making mac and cheese. Um, she was actually trying to make Pastor Benet's recipe and then stumbled upon her own, and now the Marsh kids would rather have hers than Pastor Benet's. It's kind of funny. Um, but it's, it's very sweet. It's like a dessert, kind of, and so when you're eating it, you're kind of like, I feel like I should be eating this at the end. But now the people that have had it are like, hey, is Pastor Amy bringing her dessert mac and cheese? Like she's become known as the dessert mac and cheese lady. And so um, there's... There's this thing that kind of happens. Anybody love a good potluck where you just, everybody brings their specialty? So everybody brings their best, right? And they bring the thing that they're good at. And they're like, you know what? If I'm going, I'm, I'm bringing my pie or my dessert mac and cheese or whatever it is. And so we're going to talk about that today. And the, the title of this message, if, if you want to title it or if you want to write a note at the top of your notes or whatever, just so you can kind of remember this, because we're going to circle back around at the end is, is the question, who brought this? Y'all know what, that's, what I'm talking about, right? When you go to that party and every, there's so much food and you're eating and you eat that one thing and you eat it and you're like, hey, hey, who brought this? 
Who brought this stuff? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm that guy. I'll walk around and go, did you bring this? Did you bring this? Nope. Okay, did you bring this? Did you, what did you bring? You didn't bring anything? What did you bring? Did you bring this? And so that's the question is, like, who brought this? Because I need to know, like, I, want, I may want to know the recipe. I may want to know where you bought it. If you're one of those, like, I go and buy the food and then just put it in another dish. <laughs> right? I'm not judging. I'm just saying if it's good, it's good. So we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, in order to get us going. I'm going to share a little bit of scripture here. Um, so if you got your Bibles, uh, let's look at Psalm 23. And a lot of you immediately went to, oh, I know this one. This is the one where we talk about, um, you know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, right? That's the scripture. You may hear it at like funerals or different things. And so the first four verses, uh, are, are, we're very familiar with those. But w- when you look at verse five, it ch- kind of changes the pace a little bit. And so we're going to look at five and six today. And so verse five starts like this. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Verse 6, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So there's a couple of things buried in here that I want to touch on really quick, and then we're going to get to this big spread of food and fill these benches. And so verse 5 starts off, and it says, you prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. And so the first point is this. God has created, there is a table that God has set for you. Right? He has prepared a table for you. And it doesn't matter who's around, okay? But he's made a plate for you. He's prepared a space for you to sit at. And so he's preparing because, uh, why? you know, if, if you're inviting somebody to your house, I don't have the gift of like natural hospitality, I like really have to focus and dive into it. But there are people in this room that are just naturally like that. If somebody comes to your house, like you make sure they're on their way, like you've prepared the space, like you light the candles, you, you get everything ready, and like you're fully prepared, right? Why do you do that? Because you care about them, right? You care about them. You're not trying to impress them. You just care about them. You want them to have the best experience. Well, that's what it's saying is God has prepared a place for us, okay? And I'm going to use this illustration as a table, but what you need to translate in your mind, and I think it will help us, is that this table kind of represents the house of God. And so he's saying, I have prepared a place for you, okay? In the presence of your enemies, I've prepared a place for you because I love you, and there are some things that are available for you at this table, and I want you to have it, okay? So that's kind of the first thing he hits on. It jumps right into, you anoint my head with oil, and so as we look at what this means, anoint my head, we we know that like when you use anointing oil, sometimes in the Bible that represents like a, a designation of a calling or somebody being called into something. It also is used uh, in a story with Jesus and a lady dumps perfume out on him. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a, um, a honor and reverence kind of a thing, right? A sacrificial act. And then also, and this is the kind of the one we're going to address right now, is it symbolizes favor and hospitality. And so when somebody anoints you with oil, anoints your head with oil, it's a sign of hospitality, right? It's a sign of them caring and loving for you. So I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to somebody's house and you walked in the door and they had a little thing of oil and they rubbed it on their hands and like smacked you on the forehead with it. Anybody had that happen? Whoa, more than, okay, more than I thought. But, and, and for those of us who that happened to, maybe you were like caught off guard by it and kind of like, what, what just happened? You hit me with Crisco right when I walk in the door? But what he's talking about is that's a sign of hospitality. Like, hey, you're welcome here. I want to make sure that everything's prepared. And so it's a sign of hospitality. And so as we, he says, you anoint my head with oil, and then my cup overflows. And at this point in time, when this was written, water was like a huge commodity. It wasn't like we kind of take water for granted because it's just like it's there, right? It's like an endless supply. I just turn it on, and it'll run forever. But at the time, you know, in the desert in the Middle East, water was kind of a, a commodity, right? They would use it to trade things and buy and sell stuff with it. And so for somebody to just pour 
till it runs out onto the ground or onto the table and just pour, like you can't use it anymore. Like that was a big deal. And so for in this, when he says this, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. What he's saying is that the host would be saying, I approve of you. I'm giving you my approval. I'm, give, I'm pouring out my favor on you. And so he would just pour it until it overflows. And so this picture in this, in this, uh, this scripture right here is, is kind of giving us an idea or giving us a visual of sitting at a table with, with some friends or with some family. And then he hits us with this line. It says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so I'm going to invite uh, my family to come up here and sit down really quick. So Jackson, Cameron, Logan, and then Amy, will you come up too? And while they're coming up and getting set, I want to share this with you. There's an example in the Bible where Jesus sets a table in the upper room. Anybody know this story? The Lord's Supper. He, he sets the table. And it's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to teach it in depth, but there are some highlights I want to hit. So Jesus sets the table in the upper room. And listen to this. He prepares the table already knowing that the enemy is going to be there. He already knows what's happening. He even says, this night one of you will betray me. And yet he prepares the table for him anyways. Great example of God preparing the table even in the presence of the enemies. And so Jesus dips this bread and he gives it to Judas. And so what plays out after that is very interesting and very powerful. It says that when he handed Judas the bread, Satan immediately, instantly entered Judas. And then it says... This is how Jesus responds. Jesus responds to Judas in that moment. He says, "Do what you have to do." Like we all know at this point, I know what you're going to do. You're going to betray me. We've already talked about it. One of one of you will betray me. Now I just need you to do what you're going to do. He doesn't try to talk him out of it. He just says, "Look, here's the bread." He feeds him anyways. He already knows. Then Judas does this. This is this is what's cool to me is Judas doesn't like defend himself. He doesn't like try to talk his way out of it. He just gets up and he leaves. He just got up and left. Which is a great example that, and, a, and a great reminder for us that the enemy, although sometimes the enemy can be near, the enemy cannot participate. So, so when God's trying to do something with us, the enemy can, can be near, opposition can be around, but it can't touch us. Can't touch us. So that's just a great reminder from that picture of the Lord's Supper. And so um, while you guys are up here, we'll talk about, I'll just talk about our dinner situation and what our dinners look like. <clears throat> so this is Logan. Say, hey, Logan. Wave at everybody. <laughs> She's watching herself on the screen. So Logan's five. And uh, when she comes to the dinner table, she doesn't really do much in the way of preparing food or anything like that. She really is usually the first one at the table, and she just comes in and just, she never sits this still, obviously. Um, just, I think it's, she's locked in over here. Okay. So if you don't know Logan, she has this uh, very unique personality. She's very funny. She's really hilarious, and some of the things that she does are mannerisms. So that's what she brings to the table. She just comes with this little happy five-year-old, you know, like carefree spirit. And by the end of the night, even if I'm trying to get on to somebody for something, like, hey, quit playing with your food or chew with your mouth closed or whatever, it's inevitable that she's going to make me laugh. And I, I do that thing that dads do where you try to hide your face and act like you're not laughing, but she already knows I'm laughing. So that's what she brings to the table. Jackson and Cameron bring a different set of gifts and, and some different responsibilities, they actually handle like cleaning the dishes and uh, wiping down the counter and putting the leftovers away or throwing away the food or whatever. So whatever kind of needs to be done after dinner, they really do that. Cameron sometimes will take orders like she's a waitress and bring everybody their drinks. Um, Jackson's really good at eating the food. <laughs> and then Amy is always... Most always, she's the one that, she goes to the grocery store, she gets everything. Most all the time, she will prepare the food, um, she'll set the table, and so that's, she has a little more responsibility. The biggest thing I did, I built the table, so 
that's, that's my thing. I, I built the table. So every night we sit down and go, look at this table we built. Oh, how awesome is this? No, I'm just kidding. So, so everybody kind of brings something different to the table. Um, but as you can see, like along the journey, there's different responsibilities, different gifts, different things that happen. So like for Logan, she's five. Like I'm not expecting her to do the dishes. I don't expect her to go wipe down the counter. She can barely reach them, right? I, so I just, there's different expectations and different responsibilities that Logan has versus what Jackson has as a 14-year-old boy that's learning how to be a young man, you know? Like, so there's different things that they're learning along the way. There's different things that are expected of them and then different things that they're fulfilling because they're at different places on the journey. That may sound familiar if you can picture the transformation card that we use there's different places on the journey, right? And there's different levels of maturity along the way. And so there's different responsibilities and there's different things that, that they do. And so, um, you know, they all kind of bring something different to the table each and every night. And so as we look at this idea of dwelling in the house of the Lord, which is how that uh, scripture kind of ends, it says, you know, that we're all going to dwell in the house of the Lord in order for, for every one of us to live in our house, there is something that we contribute. Your house is probably the same. If you've got kids and you don't expect them to contribute at all, you should. They have to learn this because this is part of dwelling in the house, right? Not, I'm not saying they got to pay rent, okay? Like, hey, you're going to pick up half the mortgage and all the insurance. No, no. Remember, they're at a different place, right? Different places on the journey. But they can absolutely take out the trash. They can make their beds. They can make your bed. They can, you know, so you, as a parent, you need to think about this because that's part of dwelling in the house together as a family. And so as we dwell in the house of the Lord together, he's basically kind of just reminding us that, hey, we're a big family and we all need to contribute something. We all have something that we can bring to the house. What can you contribute? And so that's kind of the first question I want to ask you is, what is it that you contribute? What do you, what do you contribute to the family, to the house? Okay, you guys can go have a seat. Um, as we move into this next little section here, I'll let y'all take off. Logan's going back to Quest across the hall, so have fun over there. Tell him you got on the big stage today. <laughs> You guys didn't get to see her fun, playful side. She's a little awestruck, I think. So as we, as we move into this, I wanna, I wanna, um, I'm going to use some different people now as we go. Okay, So if I lock eyes with you, just know it's probably, it's probably coming. Okay, Because I'm scanning the crowd right now, picking out the ones I'm coming after. Okay, So it's going to be fun. And I want to use some other people because generally in our house, it's, it's rarely, rarely is it just us five. There's usually always other people at the table with us. It could be a bunch of different types of people. It could be different ages. You know, it could be young people. It could be older people. It, it just kind of varies. Anybody watch Full House and now the, the new one's Fuller House? Okay. Do you ever notice there's not a lock on the front door, evidently? Like, they don't lock that house at all. People just roll in, like, at any point in the show. And now they kind of caught on to it. So now in the newer one, they're like, it's always open. Like, that's just, that's our dining room, evidently. Our dining room just seems to be the place where everybody, it's always open, right? And so this is actually our table and, and benches from our house. And so we, we just kind of, people just kind of land here whenever they come to the house, even if there's no food involved. And so I want to use this because um, I think this is a great example. There's a story in the book of Luke that Jesus uses a parable called the parable of the Great Supper. And he starts in verse 8, really teaching people that when you show up to dinner, you need to be wise about where you sit. You need to be wise about where you sit, okay? I'm going to use this example. I used it in the first service, and, uh, you know, Josh Marsh is in Israel, so he can't do anything to me, so he can't sneak out here and tackle me, so I'm going to use him. If, if you go to the Marsh's house, there's one seat you don't sit in. It's Joshua's seat. I don't, it's... Maybe it's just me. I don't know. He's, is it everybody? Y'all been there? Anybody that's been there, you, maybe you know. But he sits at, like, if this is their table, he'll sit right here. And so I learned just not to sit there because I think the first time I sat there, I think he actually, like, picked the chair up and dumped me out. And so then I just started sitting right here. I just sit next to him. So there's, 
But I don't think any of us, most all of us know, and it's kind of maybe common sense, and maybe, maybe you've never thought about it, maybe you do it without thinking about it. But I don't think you go to somebody's house and just sit at the head of the table. Maybe you do, and maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe it's just something we're kind of that's innate within us, but we don't just generally sit at the head of the table. Well, I think that's, I think that's built in us from a long time ago. So read, read this with me. This is Luke 14, verse 8. It says, when you are invited to an important social function, don't be quick to sit near the head of the table choosing the seat of honor. Verse 11 says, remember this, everyone with a lofty opinion of who he is and who seeks to raise himself up will be humbled before all. And everyone with a modest opinion of who he is and chooses to humble himself will be raised up before all. So it's just a good reminder that when you enter into um, somebody else's house, right, you don't just go and plop in the seat of the, the head of the table. You might wait a minute and see, okay, what's the situation here? Who normally sits where, right? Where does the dad sit? Where does the man of the house sit? Where does the, the wife sit? I don't want to sit in somebody's seat. Y'all ever felt that way before? And so you just kind of hang out and wait, All right? That's what it's given us an example of is that we're being humble. We're not just walking in going, this is my house. I'll sit where I want. Some of y'all might do that. But most of us probably don't. We wait and see kind of what the deal is. And so he starts off talking about where we're going to sit. And then he goes into this other section. And he kind of shifts gears a little bit. And so I'm going to need some help during this one, okay? Because uh, I think we're all fully aware that when you, when you come to a, uh, a gathering of some sort, whether it's a party or a dinner, um, everybody is not good at the, the same food, right? Like, some of y'all struggle with, like, mashed potatoes, like macaroni and cheese. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you struggle with, like, putting a can of biscuits in the oven and taking them out at the right time. I don't know, <laughs> right? So we, but everybody has something that they're good at, right? You can bring a gallon of sweet tea that's, you know, from the store, if you, know, if you can't make it yourself, you just go and buy one, put it, right? So everybody kind of has something that they're good at. So I'm going to borrow some people. Uh, Trisha, come on up, come on up. As I call your name, just come on up. Or if I just point at you, I need you to come on up. Uh, let's see, uh, 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 Montana, come on up. Bring Katie with you. Yep, there's Trisha. Just go ahead and have a seat wherever you'd like. Um, Josh Brown, you're trying to turn your head and look away. That's why I called on you. Um, I need somebody from the back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. You got your hand up. I'm cool, I'm cool with it. Come on. Let's see. Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Javier and Xavier. <laughs> you see, one of you thought you were going to get out of it. Uh, Will? Come on, Will. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that's good. Y'all just sit wherever you'd like. Javier and Xavier are twins, in case y'all didn't know. Okay, just clear that up really quick. Are y'all going to sit by each other? Okay, good. <clears throat> All right, so everybody's got a seat at the table. So, oh, let's see. What did you bring to the table? The coleslaw? Okay, coleslaw. Coleslaw it is. Green beans. Montana, you brought the bread. Okay, Katie, you brought all the chicken. Trisha, you brought the biscuits. Joshua, you brought the sweet tea. Okay, uh, what else we got down there? Mashed potatoes and gravy. And you brought the apple pie, my friend. Okay, Are you, do you have a secret apple pie recipe that we need to know? Nope, okay. I just thought it was worth a shot. All right, so everybody's got something that they brought that they're good at bringing, okay? Like, you guys, like, you make the best coleslaw on the planet. That's why you brought it. Because you knew that everybody needed that coleslaw, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, go with me here. Go with me. Yes, you brought it. That's why you brought it. <laughs> and so everybody comes to the table, and they bring something to the table. They don't just show up empty-handed. They come to contribute. So they have a seat at the table, okay? And so what tends to happen is that there are, there are eight of you sitting here, and there's, I think, right at eight things. I think I named everything. Um, and so we all bring the table and or bring stuff to the table. And so when we get here, we fill it up. And so we've got mashed potatoes and gravy. We've got coleslaw, green beans, chicken, biscuits, apple pie, 
some other bread, some sweet tea. So we've got a little bit of everything here. And so then Jesus turns to the host, okay? And this is where it kind of takes a little bit of a turn, but where we need to really dial in. It says, when you throw a banquet, don't just invite your friends or your relatives or your rich neighbors. He says, for it is likely that they will return the favor. See, here's what we're really good at. I'm really good at inviting these friends and family because I know that eventually they'll invite me back to their house. And so I'll invite them, and then I know that they're going to return the favor. So he's saying, be careful about that. It's better to invite those who never get an invitation. Invite the poor to your banquet, along with the outcast, the handicapped, and the blind, those who could never repay you for the favor. Then you will experience a great blessing in this life, and at the resurrection of the godly, you will receive a full reward. When they heard this, okay, when they heard this, one of the dinner guests said to Jesus, someday God will have a kingdom feast, and how happy and privileged will be the ones who get to share in that joy. And Jesus goes, okay, let me make sure we got it here. He comes back around with this. There was a man, y'all know that voice, right? That, that's the way it starts. Okay, kids, there was a man who invited many to join him in a great feast. When the day of the feast arrived, the host instructed his servant to notify all the invited guests and tell them, come, for everything is now ready for you. Did y'all see how when I called their names, they didn't really say anything, they didn't really respond, they just kind of came on? They just kind of came on up. Look at how these people respond. Come, for everything is ready for you, the table's set. But one by one, they all made excuses. One said, I can't come. I just bought some property and I'm obligated to go look it over. Another said, please accept my regrets for I just purchased five teams of oxen and I need to make sure they can pull the plow. Another one said, I can't come because I just got married. So how many of you know an excuse when you hear it? Y'all know the difference between an excuse and a reason? Okay. So... All of these were excuses. They weren't, they weren't technically reasons. And I know there are some legitimate reasons why we can't come when we're invited. Okay? Are you guys tracking? God is inviting us to the table. But sometimes we make excuses about why we can't bring our best to the table. And I'm not pinpointing anybody when I say these excuses. I'm just giving examples. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys to receive this with an open heart as a challenge, as a, as a little motivation. By no means am I trying to like use this as a condemning type of thing. I pray that it's convicting in a good way, but not condemning. Okay? So I'm going to give you some examples of excuses that over the course of 12 plus years that I've heard about why people can't come to the table. Okay? I can't serve this week because... Fill in the blank. I can't lead a small group because teenagers aren't really my thing. I don't do well teaching young kids. And I can't clean the bathrooms because of this. So these are, these are excuses. And why some of you are probably like, well, how does that make sense talking about the table? Go back to what I said. The table is representing the house of God. And so there are times where you've been invited to bring something to the house of God. And the, our response sometimes is, oh, I can't because there's a football game on. Like, I know that's kind of may come across harsh. It doesn't, I'm not meaning it that way. But it's the truth. And there's sometimes where people come into the church, and I know this firsthand, where, where people come in, they go, oh, it looks so great. There's, everything's working fine. I don't need to do anything. I can just come and sit, right? But those same people, usually when they go to somebody's house and the food's prepared and everything's done for them, they still generally ask, what can I bring? Is there anything I can do, right? If, you were just, if we were in real life and I said, hey, uh, come to this party we're having at my house, you would say, is there anything I can bring? No, 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 it's fine. Don't bring anything. Just come as you are. Bring your, bring your good attitude, whatever, you know? But when, sometimes when we come to the house of, of God and we all come together as a family, we don't ask that question of, hey, what can I bring? We just show up and eat and leave. We just consume. We don't contribute. 
And so I think God's really trying to teach us, uh, and Jesus is really trying to teach these people that, hey, listen, there's going to be times where you're invited into God's house, and there are going to be people that make excuses. And when those people make excuses, he, he kind of tells us what to do next in verse 21. So look at this, and this is kind of what he says. If you've got people that are just making excuses, here's how you respond to that. Uh, the servant reports back to the host and told them of all their excuses. So the master becomes angry and says to the servant, go at once throughout the city and invite anyone that you find, the poor, the blind, the disabled, the hurting, and the lonely, and invite them to the dinner. Bring them to the table. When the servant returned to his master, he said, sir, I've done what you asked, but there's still room for more. Like this table looks full right now because there's eight place sets, there's eight plates, there's eight cups, right? There's eight spoons, eight forks, eight knives, and there's eight people sitting here. So you're like, we're full. We can't fit any more people. But he's saying, look, there's still room for more. So the master tells him, all right, go out again. This time, bring them all back with you. Persuade the beggars on the streets, the outcasts, even the homeless. Urgently insist that they come in and enjoy the feast so that my house will be full. I say to you all, the one who receives an invitation to feast with me and makes excuses will never enjoy my banquet. And so here's what, I don't know about how, how you guys operate at home or if you're at a party or whatever, but uh, maybe you're the host of the party and you're at a restaurant or you're out in public or whatever, but this is kind of what happens at our house. Um, we, we have these benches, and so it makes it, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to add some more people. So Alan, will you come up, please? And Tannen and Todd, and then, um, let's see, who else? Um, will you come up? Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Katrina? Okay, come on up, Katrina. Um, let's see. Hmm. Matt, come on up here. Yep, come on. He had the look on his face. I just want to see where you're going to sit. There's room on this bench. Yeah, there's room. Yeah, yeah. So, so as you can see, eight people didn't fill up the table. This table was built with the idea of having ten people in mind, but there's still room for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. There's thirteen people at the table, and they could they could probably eat and be fine. As a matter of fact, when we have teenagers to our house, there's more than 13 sitting there. And so there's always room for more. And so he's saying, look, go, even when it looks full, go out and get more people. And if they make excuses, go find others and bring them to the house, right? Bring them to the table because everybody, everybody has something that they can bring to the table, okay? I'm going to get into that in, more, uh, in just a second. But there's, there's something else that happens is that if you run out of room on the benches, come on. Come on, Owen. So that we can always add a chair. We can always make room for more. Is everybody comfortable? Y'all ready to eat? Okay. Hey, Wes, this one's yours. <clears throat> Amy. I don't know your name, but will you come up here? I'm not, you, you, you kind of gave me the look. You can sit there. Hey, Emma, come on. What's your specialty? 
broccoli casserole? Oh, I received that. <laughs> How did I do? All right, so, so now it looks full, right? But I think there's, I think there's still room. Every, every shift or rise student, come on up. Hold these. You know at Thanksgiving when the main table runs out of room? And you've got to bring out the, like, the fold-up tables and all that? All right, a couple of y'all can sit here. There are a couple of y'all can sit over here. There, I think they're going to bring some chairs out. The rest of y'all can just kind of sit on the front, sit all over the front of the stage if you want to, sit on the, hang, hang your legs off. There you go. Y'all grab a seat. Here you go. Here you go. Some of y'all can sit right here. Like just sit on the, yeah, just sit on the edge there. It's fine. Yeah, grab a seat. If you can fit somewhere, that's great. Just squeeze on in. If not, grab a chair. Grab a chair. <clears throat> okay. So there's always room for more. There's always going to be room for more. Well, what happens when you run out of the good plates and the good glasses and the good forks? You just get the, you get the cheap stuff out, right? Who, who else needs one? Here you go. Here you, you can. Coming at you, coming at you. Dale, come on. Bree, you've tipped like three. Oh! Over there. Here we go. Coming at you. All right, who else needs one? Here you go. We're, we can't eat. We got to get everything ready, okay? We got. Should somebody take a bite out of that chicken? <laughs> All right. And then here's the cups. You guys can pass those out. Go ahead and pour yourself some tea. And so there's always, we can always make room for more people. We limit ourselves sometimes because we, oh, I don't have any more plates, or I don't have another, I don't have any more cups, or I don't have any more chairs. You guys look comfortable. Do you guys care that you're sitting on the edge of the stage right now? No. You don't? Okay. So I think we sometimes we discredit and we, we make an excuse on why we can't bring people to the table because we're out of room. They, they don't care that they're sitting right here. They're near the table, and that's enough for them. And so sometimes we look at this and we go, man, like... I'm afraid to invite people into it, or we make an excuse because of it or whatever, but there's absolutely room at the table for all of us. If I said, hey, everybody in the room, everybody in here right now, get out of your seat and come sit up here, everybody in here would find a place to sit. Nobody would stand over here and go, there's no room. I can't, I can't fit. Not a one of them said there's no room and went and sat back down out there. Every one of them found a spot. And so this is, this is the, a picture of when we come to the house of the Lord, how we should come in because we're all going to dwell here together. We're all family. And so when we come in, we just find a seat at the table. Amen. We don't have to wait on somebody to go, hey, man, like, I need you to bring something to the table. I need you to do something. I need you to, I need you to be involved. I need you to get in a small group. I need you to serve. I need you to work with shift or rise, or I need you to get on the stage and use your musical talent, right? There's a, there's a plethora of gifts and abilities and uniqueness at this table right now. So Matt Williams is a great musician. Owen, what instrument do you play? N nothing. Okay, but Matt's a great musician. He can play guitar really well. He understands music. If there was somebody at this table that could teach Owen to play music, it's Matt. They're at opposite ends of the table. But let's just assume Owen 
Owen brought the mashed potatoes, right? Or Matt. Let's say Matt brought the, uh, the green beans. Owen can't reach the green beans. He's got to have them sent in his direction. Somebody's got to pass them down. Or he doesn't get to share the gift that Matt brought. And so this is a picture of what our family needs to look like as we dwell in the house of the Lord. We all have gifts and talents and abilities. Tannen makes delicious things that, that other people at this table can't make. And Todd gets to benefit from it because he lives with her. But how often do we get to benefit from the delicious things that Tannen makes? Well, if she brings them to the house, then we all can share it. And so... Everybody here, and I brought up a bunch of young people because sometimes we go, well, they're just teenagers. But really, what you or may or may not know is that every one of them has a special, unique gift inside of them that they bring to the house. Maggie, what do you do on Sundays? What do you do here, though? Like, oh, I'm at the church. You, you serve in Quest. Yes. What do you do in Quest? I worship. You lead worship? Okay, so here we have a young person that brings a gift to, to the house of the Lord every week, and because of that, kindergartners are over there dancing and worshiping and learning what that means, all because of a gift that Maggie has that, honestly, some of us at this table just don't have, right? Trisha has gifts that, that Owen doesn't have because she's further along on the journey than Owen is. Now, Owen may potentially develop those gifts, but right now in this moment, Trisha has a set of gifts that Owen doesn't have. And we all, this is a picture of all of us right now, is that we all have something that we bring to the table, that we bring to the house of the Lord when we dwell here together, that we're not just coming and sitting in the chair and consuming, that we're actually contributing something, not just to the house and not just giving something to God, but we're sharing it with each other. And just because you're not sitting at the main table doesn't mean that you don't get the same thing. Right? Because all Katie has to do is turn around and hand you a piece of chicken. Okay? So it's, it's a picture of how we can share gifts, how we work together, how we live together, how we dwell together. And God has absolutely has set the table for us and made preparations for us. But here are the questions that we have to ask. And you saw this as they were coming up, trying to find out where they were going to sit. The question is, will we slide in? Like, will we, will we slide down and make room for somebody else? Will we pull up a chair? Or are we going to just, oh, there's nothing here for me, and walk away? Will we pull up a chair? Will we grab the temporary paper products and, and set a place for somebody else? Will we join the supper? Will we participate? See, the preparation, the blessing, the protection, the anointing, the favor, the overflow is at the table, and the table is in his house. And so I, I want to share a story a really quick. It's an Old Testament story that I think will, um, will help kind of tie this together. Um, this is a story about a little bit about King David, but it's really not so much about King David. Um, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 4, and at this point in the, in the story... Um, Saul, King Saul has, has died, his son Jonathan has died, and David and Jonathan were like best friends, um, and, and David, of course, has become the king, right? He, he was in line to take over after Saul, um, and Saul's been killed, Jonathan's been killed, and essentially the army is, is kind of eradicating all of Saul's family, and so the news of Saul and Jonathan's death was, death was spreading, and Jonathan had a son who was five years old at the time, and his name was Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, it's a tough one, Mephibosheth, okay? And this, this little five-year-old's nurse picks him up and is trying to hurry out of town because they're, they're trying to eradicate all of Saul's family, so this kid is bound to die, Right? So she's trying to get out of town with him, um, and, and she just knows that eventually they're going to find him. They're going to kill him too. And so as she hurries to leave, she, she kind of trips and falls or, and drops him as a five-year-old and cripples both of his legs. So he's just crippled for life um, in both legs. And then we fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 9, five chapters later, 
David asked the question, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul who I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? In 1 Samuel 20, Jonathan and David made a covenant with each other before Jonathan was killed. And part of the covenant was that David would never never cut off his kindness from Jonathan's family. He had made a promise to Jonathan that, hey, no matter what happens, I'll always take care of your family. I'll always do my part to take care of your family. And so he always had, David always had the most uh, utmost amount of respect for Saul, even though Saul was trying to kill him at one point or at several points. And so David didn't forget his promise. He searches for somebody related to Saul. He hears of a servant named Ziba uh, from the house of Saul. And he asks, hey, are there any survivors of Saul's family anywhere? Is there anybody left? Right? He's looking for, he, he, this is his opportunity. He's looking for somebody to bring to the table. Is there anybody left that I can show kindness to? Ziba tells him about Mephibosheth. He says he's still alive. He's living in a place called Lodabar. And Lodabar is a place uh, that was, if you look it up, it says it's pastureless. It says no word, no communication. It's on the backside of the wilderness, extreme poverty. Like it's, it's like one of the worst places you could possibly live in this area. And that's where this, this guy lives. And so just imagine for a moment that you are um, Mephibosheth, okay? You're, you're the last remaining member of this royal family at one time, this royal family. The rest of your family has been killed. So you're the only one left. You're crippled. And in these days, it was seen as a handicap in a way like it wasn't like if you saw somebody in a wheelchair today, there's a chance you may help them. If they were struggling, you would help them. In this time, when you saw somebody crippled, you kind of just turned your head and went away from it. You kind of just pretended like they weren't there. So your whole family's been killed off. You're the only one left. You're crippled. You feel like you deserve nothing. You live in extreme poverty, and you're basically afraid of everybody on the planet because you know that they're going to kill you if they find you. If they find out that you're the last one left in Saul's family, they're going to kill you. So just put yourself in that mindset for a moment. He even, at one point in this scripture, in the story, he calls himself a dead dog. And so can you imagine what your first thought would be when the king of Israel says, when he requests that you come to see him, that you come to his, his house? What would your first response be to that? This is, this is how it goes. It says, he came before King David, he bowed before him, and to his surprise, David took care of him. Mephibosheth actually means to shatter shame or to a shame destroyer or image breaker. That's what his name means. And so in this moment, he's invited into the king's house and, it, and he learns what his name means. He, he, he sees it play out and, and he gets to fulfill the potential that he has just by coming to the king's house. Second Samuel 9, this is how David responds to him. These are, these are exactly what David said to him. And you will always eat at my table. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Verse 13, Mephibosheth always ate at the king's table. And so what we see is a picture that David made a way for Mephibosheth not just to come to the table, but he, he took care of him when he got there. He fed him. He gave him all that he needed. He said, look, you can always sit at the table right here. There's always a seat for you. I don't care if you're crippled. I don't care if you think that you're worth it. I don't care what you think about yourself. You need to know that there's always a seat at the table for you. And I think that's, I think that's what God wants to teach us today is that some of us kind of discount ourselves and we disqualify ourselves thinking that, well, I don't have the education. I can't teach kids. Or, you know, I, I, I don't know. Whatever these excuses are that we come up with, we disqualify and discredit ourselves. And he's just saying, look, I don't care about that. There's just a seat at the table for you. I just need you to be here. I just want you to be with me in, in the presence. 
And that's what David's saying to Mephibosheth, but I think that's what God is saying to us. And so he provides for him in, in tons of ways. Listen to this. David gives him everything that once belonged to his grandfather Saul. He gives him everything that was Saul's. He then gives him, he brings in his son, and he makes Ziba, who was a servant in Saul's family, he makes him Mephibosheth's servant. And he does all this in his house, in the king's house. So let's go back to the very beginning. The scripture that we talked about at the beginning is that he's prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And sometimes for us, our enemy looks different. It's not, you know, it's not Emma. She's not my enemy. My enemy might be laziness or, you know, self-doubt or fear or an addiction or rage or, or, you know, whatever we all struggle with. That's our enemy. And God says, look, no matter what, in the presence of your enemies, even though you got all that going on, I still got a seat for you. I still, there's still the anointing, right? I'm still going to make your cup overflow. I'm still going to pour out my favor on you, even though the enemy is present. But first, you just got to come and sit at the table. And so all of you guys, I just want you to know, I brought you up here for a reason. Like, it wasn't an accident. I brought you up here because you're worthy to sit at the table. Like, all of you have something that I don't have. So if I'm going to build a table and fill it, I want it to be filled with people that have something that they can bring to the table. And so all of you have gifts and abilities and talents, and you see things and you hear things that I don't hear. So I'm going to invite you to my table anytime I can. Right? Leonard's at my house all the time. He's a picky eater, but he comes and he eats and <laughs> he's always there. And I love it. Right? I want him to always be at the table because he brings something to the table that I don't have. Even Jackson doesn't have it, but his, his best friend has it and he can bring it anytime. And so there's this, this is just hopefully it's a picture and we all see it that there is a seat for you at the table. There's a seat for you at the king's table. God is inviting you to sit at his table. He's inviting you to come to his house. He's inviting you to bring whatever your gift and passion and ability is. Like There are plenty of things that can be... There's plenty of ways to serve in the house. There's lots of things that can be done. But there's also lots of gifts that you have that the house needs that the house just doesn't know that we need. And so a lot of times we stand on the outside and we go, well, they just don't need me. No, the, the house absolutely needs you. We're to dwell in the house of the Lord together. And part of that is we just bring what we're good at. I, nobody has to ask Amy to bring her dessert mac and cheese anymore. She just knows she's bringing it. Amy Farley... Nobody has to ask for her to bring these little cupcakes that she makes. I've never once asked her to bring them to my house. But they are, I'm telling y'all, like, these little coffee cupcakes that she makes, I will eat one on the spot. I will act like I'm taking one to my wife, and then I know that she's not going to eat it, so then I get that one too. <laughs> and I'll pack another one to take home for later because they're that good, right? But she has a gift with that cupcake. But I don't have to ask her to bring it. As a matter of fact, when she brings it, I'm like, would you please stop bringing these cupcakes? I hope you all are seeing this. There are some gifts in the room and some things that you're really, really good at and that God has given you a, a gift and, a, and an ability that I would, I would love and I know Pastor Ivy would love and Pastor Benet would love and all the people on staff and all, all the people in leadership of the church would love to go, hey man, can you stop being so happy all the time? You just got this gift of happiness. So there's just a bunch of people in the room that, that we all have something that we can bring to the table. Maybe it's wisdom. Maybe it's joy. Maybe it's happiness. Maybe it's this patience, this peace that just comes out of you. <clears throat> And so what is the thing that you bring? What is the unique thing that you bring to the table? And so this is, this is how I want to end this because um, 
this is, this is what we do when you go to the party. I talked about it at the very beginning. You go, man, who brought this? Who brought this green fluffy stuff? Who brought it? I need to know. It's very good. I want to, who brought it? Okay. Everybody in this room, you've walked into this place before. You've walked into God's house before. And you've walked in and went, man, there is like some joy in here. Who brought that? And there's like this peace when I'm, when I'm around these people. Who brought that? Who brought the peace? Like, what is this overwhelming sense of like, you know, like God's presence? Who brought that in here? Right? That's the, that's the goal. That's what our, our heart should be tuned to is like when we show up that people go, hey, who brought this? Did you bring this? Did you bring the joy? Did you bring the Who brought the joy? Which one of y'all brought the joy? Which one of you brought the peace because I feel it and it feels good and I want more of it and I know that everybody at the table wants to share some of that peace but who brought it because I need you to pass it my direction I need you to send me some down here I'm struggling with something I I need some encouragement who's got the encouragement where's it at I need somebody to send it my way I just feel like I need somebody to pray for me who's got a gift of prayer I want, that, I want that in my direction. Send it, send it down the table. I'll take it down here. And so we can use practical things, practical gifts, but there's also a much deeper, much more spiritual look at this, right? There's lots of things that we bring to the table. So the question of the day is, what do you bring into the table? What do you bring into the table? Everybody's got something to contribute. It may be something small. It may be something huge, but everybody can contribute a little bit. So our challenge now is to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Just like if we were being invited to a dinner party, where do I sit and what can I bring? Where do I sit? What can I bring? God, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for, I thank you for preparing a table for us. God, I thank you for the anointing. God, I thank you for overflowing our cups so that we would receive your favor and your hospitality. God, I thank you for always providing something for us and preparing a way for us, making sure that we have a seat at your table. God, I just ask right now that you would would speak to us. God, send Holy Spirit into our minds right now. Just give us the thing that we can contribute to the kingdom. God, we all have a gift, we all have an ability, a talent that that maybe people know about, maybe they don't, but we can contribute something. And so God, as we as we bring our thing to the table, whatever it may be, as we bring it to the house, God, would you allow us to share it with others? God, then would you allow us to go out and invite more people to the table? God, we love you. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for this visual. And I pray that everybody sees this picture and and understands this message and, and this illustration in a deeper way when they sit down for dinner tonight. So God, thank you for blessing this house. Thank you for blessing this, this church. Thank you for blessing all of these people today. And God, we receive everything that you're pouring out on us, even to the point of overflow. God, we receive it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.